This battle that I'm going to speak about today is largely forgotten, but was a massive operation carried out by all countries involved. Over 200,000 naval personnel would take part in the battle. They would operate over 400 vessels, majority of which were battleships and destroyers. This battle or campaign would last three days and would see over 10,000 casualties and was the largest naval operation carried out in history. Today, we're talking about the Battle of Leyte Gulf. The Battle of Leyte Gulf would be a campaign consisting of four major naval engagements. Right before the battle, the Japanese had failed to gain any ground in the Pacific, mostly due to the behemoth that was the United States manufacturing rate. Japan was unable to match the production of ships, and had failed to resupply their occupied islands throughout the Pacific. The Imperial Navy seen it as too costly to resupply when they were in such a desperate state. The United States Marine Corps, along with the Army, hopped island to island, a costly campaign, but it proved to be effective, as the Japanese Army that was stationed on these islands were left starving. Between June 19th and 20th, Japan went head-to-head -head with the United States Navy in the Battle of the Philippines. A significantly smaller engagement than the Lite Gulf, but massive in comparison to most naval battles. Japan took a loss of 2,987 sailors, compared to only 109 United States deaths. Only one U.S. destroyer was officially damaged, while Japan had two fleet carriers sunk, one light aircraft carrier, two oilers sunk, and with six other ships damaged. The Imperial Japanese Navy took yet again another blunder in the Pacific, but they still had a massive navy, and they would be prepared to risk it all to keep their supply lines open to the Philippines. But the United States had plans to invade the island of Leyte, located in central Philippines, and the United States troops that were assigned to invade the island would have close naval support. The U.S.'s 7th Fleet would have to safeguard the invasion, as well have to control the seaways through attrition and set up a supply line for the ongoing invasion of Leyte. The 3rd Fleet would also offer distant support to help maintain a presence in the area, with the 7th Fleet also having ships from the Royal Australian Navy, which were battle-hardened veterans, their last engagement only being days prior. It was pivotal for Japan's empire to stop this invasion. If their supply line to the Philippines was to be compromised, it would be a massive blow and cause a halt of supplies that their empire desperately needed. Japan at the time mostly relied on conquered territory for almost every resource. The way they seen it, the United States had backed them into a corner, and they would need to risk it all or face losing their great empire. On September 21st, the United States began making preparations for the invasion. For the first time, they bombed targets in Luzon, an island in Manila, using a carrier task force. Days later, on September 24th, the United States Navy carried out bomber runs along with reconnaissance missions to the islands of Leyte. The information compiled from these raids showed that the Japanese had lacked a presence in the area, possibly from being spread too thin. October 20th, the Navy would begin to bombard the island, and the Army met no resistance on the beach. The Japanese decided to leave the beach uncontested, setting up their defenses further inland, a tactic that they used many times before, and it proved to be effective when unable to be resupplied. But this time, Japan's navy would go all in, trying to keep the waters within their control. The Japanese navy brought with them their center force that consisted of 15 destroyers, 12 cruisers, as well five of the most advanced battleships of the time, with the Haruna, Congo, Nagato, Mushashi, and the largest battleship in history, the Yamato. On October 23rd, two submarines that went by the name of Darter and Dace, which were attached to the United States Navy's 3rd Fleet, had spotted the Japanese fleet near the Palawan Islands. They began to pursue the Japanese ships, 
running recon and passing information back to the rest of 7th and 3rd Fleet. One of their radio transmissions was picked up by the Yamato, but they failed to pass along the information, so the submarine's presence would remain undetected. The battle would officially commence when Darter fired six torpedoes into the Otago's hull. Darter's crew then loaded back up within minutes and engaged the Otago's sister ship, the Takao, but only two torpedoes landed. Dace would follow suit by sending another flurry of their own at the Maya. The Otago and Maya would quickly sink, and two other ships were badly damaged. The only U.S. casualty is Darter would end up crashing into an island. Their submarine needed to be abandoned, and Dace recovered their crew with no casualties. Later on, the Japanese Navy mustered an aircraft carrier fleet to back their naval center force, and they sent a wave of planes towards American ships. But they were intercepted by U.S. Hellcats and destroyed. But one Japanese aircraft, which was a Yokosuka, D4Y3, it spotted the USS Princeton, an independence class aircraft carrier, and the Americans were arming planes on the ship with torpedoes. As the Japanese bomber approached the Princeton, the crew went running as it continued to dip down and release a wave of armor-piercing bombs. All the torpedoes on the ship would erupt, and it caused a series of fires that began to spread throughout the ship. The Birmingham, a light cruiser that came alongside to assist with putting out the fire on the Princeton. As they began to assist in putting out the fire, a massive explosion erupted. 108 men aboard the USS Princeton were killed. Her surviving crew of 1,361 men were rescued by other ships. In all, including the Birmingham, there were 234 men dead and 426 wounded. It would be the only time during the war that this class of aircraft carrier would be destroyed. U.S. Hellcats returned the favor with bombing and torpedoing the Mushashi, Nagato, and Yamato, damaging all three battleships. The USS Franklin sent another wave of Hellcats, landing a massive bombing run on the Mushashi, along with eight torpedoes. One of Japan's prize battleships was destroyed. A smaller force would be sent to help bulk the rest of their navy, with this mostly consisting of Japanese destroyers. By October 25th, the battle was in full swing. The Japanese would lose another destroyer. They also had other ships damaged as they pushed into the Seguro Strait. Japanese ships would also have to avoid a wave of PT boats sent by the U.S. 7th Fleet. This lasted for hours, but miraculously, the Japanese Navy made it out without a scratch. But it led to another massive engagement, starting with the U.S. sinking the Fuso, which it was literally split right in half as multiple cruisers launched torpedoes into it. Battleships and cruisers blasted back and forth at each other. The Yamashiro and Magomi were both damaged by armor-piercing rounds. All of this occurring while there's another massive engagement taking place throughout Samar. These two gigantic battles taking place side by side, seeing multiple ships on both sides sink to the ocean floor, and others damaged having to return to port. Some were later retired, and it was one of two times during the war that Japanese and American battleships would clash. The only time this occurred was during the Battle of Guadalcanal. October 26 would put an end to the battle, but not without another bloody bombardment of armor-piercing rounds and torpedoes. Waves of aircraft crashed into the ocean floor and was the first time during the war that a kamikaze attack was carried out. The United States and Japan threw everything they had at each other. Some ships that were used in this battle had previously seen action at Pearl Harbor. You had old World War I battleships and others dated back to the 1800s. And both countries would commit their most advanced fleets. In all, the United States seen 3,000 sailors killed or injured. They also lost an aircraft carrier, two cruisers, three destroyers, and 255 planes. 
Japan took a loss of 12,000 casualties, 10,000 of them were KIA, 4 aircraft carriers, 3 battleships, 10 cruisers, 11 destroyers, and 300 planes downed. Two submarines also engaged in combat related to the Battle of Leyte, where nearly 2,000 U.S. sailors lost their lives. And you had Australia, who lost 92 men during the battle. The Leyte Gulf and its islands continued to remain contested turf as the invasion went on, but it would be the last time during the war that the Japanese Navy were able to commit such a large-scale operation. They had lost too many ships, and now having their supply line to the Philippines compromised meant this officially marked a downward spiral for the Japanese Empire. The Philippines campaign also cost another 16,000 American lives. With another 47,000 wounded, the Japanese suffered a staggering 420,000 deaths. With the Philippine Islands seeing the brunt of it all, having 1.5 million civilian deaths. So, I hope you guys thought that that was an interesting episode. I mainly wanted to make this episode because naval combat during World War II was extremely brutal and generally really overlooked. If there was to be a battle like this that occurred today with the technology becoming more advanced, the crews to operate them become larger, which make the casualty rates even higher. On average, an aircraft carrier today carries a crew of around 5,000 men to operate it, which is a shit ton more than back in World War II, which was the average of 1,200 men. As well, the cost and time that's put into making these ships makes it the most expensive form of combat by far. And hopefully, with all the muscle in the water today, it continues to be for show. With all that being said, I hope you guys have a good one, and I'll catch you guys in the comments.